Canadian journalist Ayub Nuri has lived anything but a quiet life so far. Even before he reported from the front lines in the fight against ISIS, he lived through the Iran-Iraq war and former Iraqi President Saddam Hussein's chemical weapons attack on his hometown. Then came crippling UN sanctions and the American invasion of Iraq in 2003. And it's a wonder he is here to tell the tale, but happily he is. And his new book, Being Kurdish in a Hostile World, captures his story and a great deal more. Ayub Nuri joins us now with more, and it's so good to see you again. So good to see you, you thank you. You reminded me just before we started that uh, you and I met a few years ago at a library here in Toronto. Yes. And I remember you handing me your card and saying, if you ever need somebody to speak about Iraq, I'm your guy. And here you are. Yes. With a yes. book to boot. Yes. Well, yes. You're, not, you're not even 40 years old yet, right? No, not yet. Is it a bit early for a memoir if you're not even 40 yet? Well, I think living a few years in Iraq, you, you, you will have a memoir to write. Life isn't easy, or it has never been easy. So a few years would give you enough material, especially as a journalist, to say to have a lot to say. Because p probably in 40 years in, in your part of the world is equivalent to 80 years here in terms of the kinds of events that you see. I, I think so, yes, definitely. <laughs> you grew up in, a, in the Kurdish region of Iraq called Halabja, right on the border with Iran. And I think we need to start with what Halabja means because doesn't that just sum up so much about the story we're going to tell here? What does Halabja mean? Halabja, well, according to my parents and some people in the city, the word Halabja means the wrong place. And they believe that it came, it was, it came from a group of nomadic families who were in search of pastures for their animals and they mistakenly camped somewhere only to realize later on it was the wrong place. And the name basically caught on from two words, Halabja, the wrong place, which became later Halabja. That's one of the interpretations. It has other interpretations too, but I think that's the most befitting name to my city because of all the troubles it went through later on. Well, let's go through some of that because you, you yourself and your family and your friends were in the wrong place often. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to roll your pant leg up and show us your knee, which does it still have shrapnel in it? Uh, no, there's a, a screw, a metal screw in it holding some of the bones together, Why? but there's a lot of scars because in uh, 1980, Iran and Iraq went to war and they had a, a bloody war that lasted eight years. And uh, my town, which was right on the border between northern Iraq or the Kurdish part of Iraq and Iran, bore the brunt of that war and there was daily uh, bombardment by artillery from both sides of the country and one of those uh, shells landed uh, on our farmhouse which killed my uh, grandmother a shrapnel and one of the shrapnels destroyed my knee so my family were only one of the mm, hundreds of thousands of victims of that war that lasted for eight years between iran and iraq and it started only when i when i was only one year old, and I was hit when I was four years old in 1983. How, how do you get medical treatment when you are hit by a bomb in the wrong place? Well, that's a good question, but I mentioned in the book, uh, surprisingly, the only good hospitals in Iraq then were, were the military hospital, because uh, uh, Saddam Hussein, or Iraq's former dictator, spent all the country's resources and money on weapons and the military and military hospitals. So I was rushed to a military hospital. Uh, it shows how belligerent this man was. The, the, the best facility was not for civilians, but for the military. And that's when I was initially treated. You and your family eventually left Halabja. You went to Iran. Why did you feel you needed to leave? We needed to leave in 1987 because my father got into trouble with the Iraqi regime. He possessed an illegal weapon and one day he tried to, he was firing on uh, Iraqi uh, army helicopters that were hovering over town. Basically years and years of frustration and anger at the regime that uh, was persecuting millions of Kurds in my part of the country. He, he felt like he needed to fight back. Now let's understand this. You live in Iraq. Technically, you are an Iraqi. Yeah. You are at war with Iran, but you are also at war with Saddam Hussein, the leader of Iraq. Yes. Can you explain how that makes any sense at all? Yes, it's exactly. It would be strange to know that you would fight two countries. But uh, during the Iran-Iraq war, the old saying that says the enemy of my enemy is my friend 
there is no, I mean, the Kurds knew that Iran was not an angel, and millions of Kurds also suffered in Iran. But because Iran was trying to topple the regime of Saddam Hussein that was persecuting us, the majority of Kurds, especially Kurdish rebel groups and political parties, uh, sided with uh, the Iranian army. And there was also some sympathy among ordinary people, to a degree, to the Iranian army, hoping that they would topple the Iraqi regime and we would be free as a result. So we were spectators, we were the victims of this war, but we were hoping that the Iraqi regime would lose the war. And you eventually moved to Iran, yes? And yes, in 1987, when we got word that the Iraqi secret police were plotting to take my whole family for my father's actions and anti-regime sympathies, we had to pack up one day, my entire family and my grandmother and my sister's children uh, had to get into the back of an SUV and cross the mountains into Iran. I was going to say, you, you, you snuck across, obviously. How did that go? It didn't go well initially. We had to go through a checkpoint and we had to go through no man's land. So the Iraqi soldiers and checkpoints were suspicious as to where we were going. We, were, we said we were going to our old farm and to have a picnic, but they knew they didn't buy the story. However, they still somehow let us through and we drove for one day and then we trekked for a day and a night until we crossed the border into Iran. I'm going to read an excerpt from your book now because while you were in Iran, this happened in your former hometown. The bombs they dropped didn't explode with a big bang as they hit the ground. Instead, they filled the air with the scent of apples, garlic, and cucumber. Nobody knew where this intense smell of fruit was coming from. Curious, people came out of their bomb shelters, looked up, and sniffed the air. They were standing there, mystified by the strange smell. When they began to see groups of men, women, and children coming from the lower parts of town, covering their noses and mouths. Chemical bombs have been dropped, they said, as they coughed heavily. What happened next? You know, what happened next was uh, 5,000 people, uh, men, women, and children, including animals, died that day in, on March 16, uh, 1988. And uh, they were defenseless people because the town was taken by the Iranian army and the Iraqi regime retaliated by dropping chemical bombs on the Iranian army. But the victims were the people of my town. My, one of my sisters, one of my brothers, and my father were in the city in Halabja that day. And they miraculously uh, survived and crossed the border uh, into Iran, where we uh, reunited again. But uh, that shows the, the brutality of the regime that I was growing up under. You, ha you are in war, at war with your neighboring country, Iran, but you retaliate indiscriminately against civilians and kill 5,000 people in one day. How would you characterize the world's response to that chemical weapons attack? Unfortunately, in the 1980s, the world were friends with Saddam Hussein, with Iraq's dictator. So it happened. It was Iraqi airplanes that dropped the bombs. Almost everyone knew. We, the people of Halabja, knew. But uh, the world did not say anything. And they were saying, well, we know it has happened. We cannot establish right now who perpetrated this crime. Was it Iran? Was it Iraq? They were friends. Only years later, when they, when they fell out of favor with Saddam Hussein, did they use this chemical attack against his regime, saying Saddam Hussein is brutal and killed his own people with chemical weapons. So they were quiet when it happened, and later they used it as evidence to topple his regime. They were quiet when it was in their interest to keep it quiet, when, he was when they thought he was still an ally. Exactly. When he was an ally, they didn't say anything at all. Uh, let's move ahead. In 1990, the Iraqi government declared an amnesty for all Iraqis who had fled the country. The way you put it in the book, the man who attacked us with chemical bombs now wanted to forgive us. Yeah. How much did your family trust this invitation to come home? To be honest, we did not trust him at all because he declared three amnesties. The first and the second, many people left the camps and went back to Iraq and they were taken from the border in military trucks and buried alive or killed in mass executions in the southern deserts of Iraq. And we had no way to know what happened to those people who went back. So we somehow, my father trusted the, reg the Iraqi regime on his third amnesty and we went back. But thankfully, uh, we did not go through what the previous people had gone uh, before us. We, there was no trust, but uh, we thought that going back to our country was better than living in a refugee camp in Iran. And when you did go back, what happened? 
When we went back, we were welcomed at the border, and once again processed by the Iraqi military, and we had no idea where they were taking us. But uh, they, they dumped us at a small town somewhere and said, you are not allowed to go back to Halabja, the town where we had left. After the chemical attack, it had been turned into a no man's land by the Iraqi army. For, three, for four years, actually, we were not able to go back to Halabja. Uh, I don't want to push this comparison too much for obvious reasons, but, but Canada is a federation between the national government and all the provinces and territories. And Iraq is also a federation, right? And Kurdistan, the Kurdish part of Iraq, is a federated, I guess for 25 years now, autonomous province within Iraq. Yeah. Did life change in Kurdistan, or the Kurdish part of Iraq, however you want to describe it, did it change after it became an autonomous region? Yes, it changed. The, the, it was the best feeling that we had in 1991 when uh, the, we managed to basically liberate the Kurdish provinces of uh, northern Iraq and come out of Iraqi control because there was a Kurdish government, Kurdish parliament, Kurdish elections, and uh, at checkpoints you did not fear anymore to, to be caught by Iraqi soldiers except for a period of time which I mentioned in the book there was a civil war between two major Kurdish parties in northern Iraq over revenues over control and territory but thank God it did not last long and later they made peace and created a joint parliament and the Kurdish government so life changed dramatically and it showed that when you allow a people to run their own affairs they prosper. How is it that you speak English so well? Uh, because I think since I was a child, I have had the, uh, a love for the English language in my blood, and I have been studying and teaching myself English day and night. And even now, I, there is not a single day I do not check the Oxford English Dictionary, <laughs> not for new words, even for words that I have known for, for years, I still go back to see if they have a meaning that I have missed. But I gather you listen to the, you listen to the radio, the BBC? I listen to the radio every single day, the BBC, and in Canada, the CBC. How is it, Ayub, that all of this tragedy in your background didn't just make you conclude life is hopeless to hell with it? Well, uh, especially in recent, in the last 10 years, working as a war correspondent and covering all the conflict and the, the ISIS war, the American invasion, the Iraqi sectarian war, it made me more uh, hopeless. Before I was uh, hopeful and later these 10 years made me really hopeless and said, why is it only getting worse day after day, especially covering Mosul and ISIS war in the last two years? But to answer your question, I think uh, you need hope in order to survive when everything is hopeless around you and if you become hopeless you would only make it worse for yourself so I, I need that dose and others need that dose of uh, hope in order to cope what was your reaction when President George W Bush ordered the invasion of Iraq and the toppling of Saddam Hussein my reaction I think was the same as uh, millions of other Kurds and also millions of other Iraqis that uh, it was good news we had tried uh, in many ways to uh, free ourselves, and people in southern Iraq had, did, had done the same thing. But it was impossible. The regime's retaliation was always as brutal as we saw, mass killings and the chemical attack and all that. So we thought only a powerful country like the United States could topple this regime. How do you feel about it today? I still think it was good that Saddam Hussein was removed. I know after toppling Saddam Hussein, Iraq went through a bloody period that is still recovering or still going through yes. it. Uh, Shias and Sunnis killing each other and rebel groups basically popping up here and there. But I think I don't think that part was the Americans' fault. The Americans removed the regime to give Iraqis and Kurds and everyone a chance, but the Iraqis did not seize that chance to build a new modern democratic country. They set upon each other to settle old scores. I'm going to ask you a bit of a strange question here. Have a sip of water, by all means, as I set this up. <laughs> Most of the Western world thinks ISIS is terrible and needs to be destroyed. Yeah. In a strange way, are the Kurds happy about the fact that ISIS happened because it has brought the Western world into the Kurdish fight for independence in a strange kind of way because you are now allies in the fight against ISIS. Is that a strange conclusion to come to or what do you think of it? 
Well, it's all related. It's a good point. There has been some accusations against the Kurds, saying the Kurds are opportunistic. They use the war against ISIS to carve out a country for themselves. But I think that's not true. The Kurds, uh, it's good in a way that the world woke up to the plight of the Kurds finally after ISIS. Because the Kurds have been going through slaughters and persecutions and massacres for many decades. Only when ISIS came and ISIS th started to threaten the Western world and their interests too, they realized this is a very brutal group. And then we turned around and said, this is what we have been dealing with for a hundred years in Iraq. So with the arrival of ISIS, the plight of the Kurds coincided with the interests of the Western world, and also, especially when they felt uh, threatened by ISIS. But this is by no means an opportunistic move by the Kurds to move towards independence. It's only to say, this is what we have been dealing with, and by creating a state of our own, we don't want to be part of Iraq and its endless troubles anymore. Well, you've raised independence, so let me follow up on that, because in late September, the Kurdish part of Iraq voted yes in a referendum for independence. And some of the world responded rather harshly to that. And let me just go through some of it here. The Iraqi Prime Minister, Haider al-Abadi, said the referendum, quote, threatens Iraq, peaceful coexistence among Iraqis, and is a danger to the region. Turkey's President Erdogan described the vote as, quote, unacceptable, and threatened to close his country's sole border, crossing the Iraqi Kurds' vital oil export pipeline. Iran called the vote illegal, having banned all flights to and from the Kurdistan region a day earlier. And even the Secretary General of the United Nations expressed concern about the, quote, potentially destabilizing effects of the vote. What do you think of all those responses? I disagree with all of those responses, especially the part about destabilizing the region. The Kurdish part has been the most stable part of Iraq. It has become a safe ha haven for 1.8 million Iraqi and Syrian refugees, Christians, Yazidis, all kinds of religious and ethnic minorities who are slaughtered by ISIS and Iraqi militia groups have found a home and the, where they could freely practice their religious beliefs in the Kurdistan region. And the argument for independence is that we want to at least, when this fire is raging all across the Middle East, engulfing Syria and Iraq and Yemen and everywhere else, we want to at least preserve this stable part. The Kurdish region wants to be independent and be a force for good in order to hopefully become a model for the rest of other places where you could respect everyone. But unfortunately, the United Nations uh, chief among them is against this people's right, democratic right, of saying we want to be independent and express our democratic will. By no means the Kurdish independence, Kurdish independence will destabilize the region. I'm down to my last 20 seconds here, Ayub, and uh, the book is called Being Kurdish in a Hostile World. Do you ever see a time when the world will not be as hostile to Kurdish interests? I think they, hopefully, yes. If they listen to the Kurdish aspirations and desires, they will prove that they are not hostile to the Kurds. It's a fascinating read. Congratulations on getting it done. Slau, is that the right thing to Slough, say? Slau, yes. Slau, which Slough. is Kurdish for? Hello. OK. Yes. Yeah. How, how about for thank you? What should I say? Spas. Spas. So spas. OK, thank that you. too. Thank you very much. Ayub Nuri, being Kurdish in a hostile world. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.